The Value of Social Media as a Marketing Strategy with Jay Harrington, episode 230. Are you ready to make your law firm a profit-generating machine that will free up your time and skyrocket your impact? With more than two decades of business growth experience and having proven that you can be successful while prioritizing your family and your impact, introducing the Profit with Law podcast. I am your host, the creator of the firm differentiator 10x effect, Moshe Amsel. Well, hello and welcome to another amazing guest interview here on the Profit with Law podcast. My guest today is a a fellow by the name of Jay Harrington, and I'm excited about this conversation we're going to have because Jay got uh, got to the show because I reached out to him and I said, hey, I'd love to connect with you. I'd love to get to know you. I'd love to put, you know, um, have you as a guest on the podcast because he kept showing up in my LinkedIn feed. And uh, not, not only was he showing up, but I was really drawn to the post that he was saying, just the way he was communicating his message. Uh, and it, it resonated with me. Uh, and I, I said, you know what, I, I really need to see what this guy Jay is up to what he's doing and um, and talk about some of that here on the podcast. And I'm excited that he said yes, we get to spend some time with him and to uh, dive into exactly what he is doing with that strategy on LinkedIn um, and with his thought leadership messaging. Uh, so can't wait for this conversation to happen. And I hope that you're going to be here for the ride as well. A lot of you have uh, been asking me how do I harness LinkedIn for my, for my legal practice? Like what, you know, if I'm a business to consumer uh, practice, so for example, I'm in bankruptcy law, uh, you know, am I better off on, on Facebook? If I am a business to business practice, then I totally understand how LinkedIn can be valuable, but, but, but how, what's the strategy? What do I do? And I think that we're going to start to answer that question today on this podcast. Uh, and I'm excited. I'm just excited to have him here. So we're going to jump into that, but stick with me for a moment. We're going to thank our sponsors who make this show possible. Take a moment, listen to it. If anything that they're offering is something that could be of value to you, just take a moment, jot down the, the URL, come back, look at the show notes. It's all, all of that is going to be linked up in the show notes. Uh, it's in the description of the podcast as well in your podcast player. I know you might be out, out for a run or on your Peloton uh, kicking butt right now, but uh, when you're done, go back and check out our sponsors. We greatly appreciate you doing that. Here we go. Finding amazing employees is the toughest job for any business and especially for a law firm. You deserve to be the law firm owner you've always wanted to be, but you can't get there without a great team. Get Staffed Up helps you build your all-star team by staffing your law firm with incredible full-time offshore virtual assistants. Work with Get Staffed Up to save money and your biggest resource, time, while they find you the best English-speaking VAs in the world. Hashtag delegate your way to freedom. To learn more, go to profitwithlaw.com forward slash get staffed up. Profitwithlaw.com forward slash get staffed up. Thanks to our sponsor, Smith AI. Smith AI is a superior virtual receptionist service for small businesses. They specialize in working with solo and small law firms. I discovered Smith AI a couple of years ago and was blown away by the range of services, which are available at a cost any attorney, even those of you in the smallest solo practice can afford. Their friendly receptionists respond to potential clients in English or Spanish, screen and schedule new leads, and even take payment for consults. The best part is they don't just handle these conversations by phone. They also have live agents and chatbots capturing leads on websites and via text message. If there's one growth hack to your practice, this is it. Smith's friendly gatekeepers can staff your front lines. They'll capture new leads while you work uninterrupted. You can finally have the peace of mind that while you're working, you're not missing out on future work. Plans start at just $210 a month for calls and $140 a month for chats. They even offer a totally free chatbot, so there's no excuse. 
Try Smith AI today and see for yourself why attorneys like Justy Nickel in Colorado say Smith AI receptionists are the secret to business growth and client happiness. Smith AI offers a free trial and podcast listeners can get an extra $100 discount with promo code ProfitLaw100. That's ProfitLaw100. Sign up and learn more at www.smith.ai. Trust me when I say, don't let another day go by. Try Smith AI. And we are back. Jay, welcome to the show. It is great to be here. Thank you. I really, really appreciate you uh, being giving with your time and your and, and your effort here. Um, I want to actually, you know what I, I didn't do um, in the intro, I normally read off the official bio and I didn't do that. Um, and therefore, I didn't plug your podcast. So I'm going to do that right now real quick because I forgot. Um, Jay Harrington is a business coach and trainer and consultant to lawyers and law firms. He's the founder and president of Harrington Communications, a leading thought leadership marketing agency for law firms. Jay is the host of the Thought Leadership Project podcast and is the author of three books, The Productivity Pivot, One of a Kind Lawyer, and The Essential Associate. Jay formerly practiced law at Skadden Arps and Foley and Lardner, and he also founded and ran a boutique corporate restructuring law firm. He is a graduate of the University of Michigan Law School. Uh, so Jay, fill in the blanks. Tell us who you are. People, they want to know, like, who is this guy that we're talking to? So they don't want to know the, the pedigree. They don't want to know what law school you went to. They want to know who you are as a person. So give us give us some, some background to that. Um, How do you end up in law and how do you end up doing something that's not running a law firm? Yeah. Okay. So I'd say that how I got into the law, like many people, I stumbled into it to an extent, right? I, I was one of those people that got an undergraduate major that didn't seem to have great career cro- uh, prospects. So then I applied to law school, um, you know, practice law for about six years. And that, at that point, I left to start this business that I'm running now, Harrington Communications. I did have a, a, a zig back to the law. I started my own small firm. Did that for about three years. I did do corporate restructuring work. So it was about 2009. Um, it was at that point, as everyone remembers, financial crisis. I was in Detroit. So we also had the automotive crisis. And I thought, if I'm ever going to practice law again, now's the time. So I did start my own firm, kind of did that for about three to four years as the corporate restructuring wave built and, and ultimately crested. Uh, and then got back out. And for the last eight years or so, have been focused back on this business exclusively. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what what I guess uh, motivates me to do this, I was looking to do something that at the time I perceived as more entrepreneurial, where I got in, started my own company outside of the law. You know, what I've come to learn since then is that you can be very entrepreneurial within a law firm, within a legal practice. It's just something that I didn't quite realize at the time as an associate working in big firms. Um, and yeah, so since then, um, I we've took our business virtual. Uh, I was living in the Detroit area previously. We had a bricks and mortar office, and then that allowed us to move to a place that we really wanted to live, um, kind of build more of our our business around our life as opposed to the other way around. So we're now up in northern Michigan and in Traverse City and and loving life. Um, got three uh, relatively young daughters and and my wife is my business partner uh, as well. So so yeah, that's a little bit about me, uh, but I'm really excited to be here. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, let's jump right into this. I'm on your LinkedIn feed and um, it's obvious that you know what you're doing, right? Because I'm, I'm looking at the post that you're posting and uh, you can see from the number of likes and the number of comments, how engaging your articles are, right? Now you have a post that was posted one day ago and it's got 88 likes. It's got 26 comments on it. Clearly people are resonating with what you, you, know, what you have to share. Um, and I'm wondering if I should just read this, this post, I'm going to read this post because I think it'll give us, um, a a basic, um, understanding of, of what you're doing here. So this is the post a little bit long Bear with me a moment. One consistently reliable way to build a profitable legal practice is to become a big fish in a small pond for many lawyers, especially those who don't have the back, the backing of a brand name law firm behind them. It's often better to focus on a small pond with less competition than it is to enter a large pond with many incumbent players. A small pond is a niche market, an industry, a demographic, a geographic location, or some combination thereof. A copyright protection lawyer who specializes in serving country music artists in Nashville. A commercial litigator in Detroit who is an expert in handling UCC disputes among auto suppliers. A small pond strategy allows lawyers to generate 
better clients by concentrating their marketing efforts on a small but specific market segment? And what client doesn't want to hire the lawyer whose service offering seems like it was established specifically for them? Specific specificity creates differentiation, which in turn creates pricing power, market visibility, more ideal fit clients. Building a big fish, small, small pond practice requires the courage to say no to poor fit clients. Saying no is hard. It's tough to turn away opportunity, but it becomes much easier to say no when you have something to say yes to. Go big by thinking small. Now, this is a great message. As a matter of fact, I have the same message on a very early podcast episode here on this podcast where um, the name, the title of the episode is Why a Niche Will Skyrocket Your Firm or Why Choosing a Niche Will Skyrocket Your Firm, something like that. Um, so uh, I completely agree with, with the sentiment of the article, especially with the last part that you kind of threw in there, which is, hey, <laughs> the only way to do this is saying no to the other thing. And that's the hardest part of this entire, this entire process. But what's interesting is, is, is um, how much traction your post got in this short amount of time. So uh, I'd like you to, to help us dive into that. Was it the content of this post? Is it because of the audience or the, the readership that you've built up over time? Uh, do you have a secret back room of rabbits that are, you know, <laughs> taking care of, of, of getting this thing to, to, you know, to have all of this traction and activity on it? Yeah, uh, some combination thereof, uh, other than the rabbits. But uh, but yeah, let me just kind of, I, I'll give maybe some basic uh, fundamental building block advice here around, around LinkedIn specifically um, and as it relates to this post. So one of the reasons why, there, there's a few reasons. One, as you mentioned, um, on LinkedIn, if you're creating content of this variety, um, it it only resonates and you can gain that sort of traction and engagement if it is content that is relevant to your target audience. And I've, you know, so I, when I think about LinkedIn, the first step in that process is, are you cultivating a network of people who care about what you have to say? So being very intentional and strategic about who you connect with, um, you know, how you then engage with that audience. So you, your content won't resonate if you don't have a network composed or comprised of the type of people who will resonate with what you have to say. Um, so that's, that's fundamental. And then from there, it's a matter really um, of consistency. Uh, so I post every day on LinkedIn. So that's a big part of, of solving this puzzle, which is showing up frequently, consistently, so that you, so people start to become familiar with you and they start to seek out your content. Um, and that the additional work that's required is also engaging with other people's content, right? So there's this rule of reciprocity that plays out in, in everything in life, but certainly plays out on LinkedIn, where if you're being generous and abundant with your um, efforts to support other people's content on the platform, they're going to tend to be much more supportive of your own, and that only that just helps to really increase your visibility uh, on the platform. There's there's something called the Matthew effect, which basically suggests that you know once something becomes popular, it becomes even more popular still. So when you show up every day and you're creating content that people like, then you'll start to get engagement. Other people will see that you're getting engagement, and they'll essentially want to get in on the action, right? It's like why a movie that opens well on a Friday night tends to do well, or something that gets on a bestseller list um, tends to, a book tends to sell well. People, people like things that other people like, and you can only create that positive sort of network effect by being there on a consistent basis. Um, really fundamentally though, if we, if we take a step back and think about you know, using LinkedIn as a thought leadership vehicle, um, it requires a change in mindset, I think, from how most people think about using LinkedIn, at least most lawyers. Um, many people think of LinkedIn from a content or a thought leadership standpoint as a place to share content that might, you might have written elsewhere, like on your blog or some other website. So you're sharing a link to that content. But I think that the best way to use LinkedIn is to think about LinkedIn as your blog, not necessarily as a place to share content from your blog. And that means creating content that lives natively on LinkedIn. You'll see, you know, from the post you read, there's no link to an outside website. Um, there's no graphic or image associated with that post. I just wrote an approximately 200 word post on LinkedIn itself. And why that's important and why that, that type of post gets a lot of visibility is the fact that LinkedIn wants to keep people on LinkedIn. It doesn't want to send people to some other website. 
So when you're sharing links and that's all you're doing, then your post is not going to get that much visibility on LinkedIn. And it's not to say that you shouldn't use LinkedIn as a vehicle to promote your content that you're creating elsewhere. It's just that you should add to the mix content that lives natively on LinkedIn. Um, so I'll stop there, but those are a few of the tips. There's, there's a lot more to it. I mean, we could dive much deeper into how to structure a post and that kind of thing, and maybe we'll get to that, but I'll, I'll pause there because I think that last point of that fundamental mindset shift of thinking of LinkedIn as your blog, not as a place to share links from your blog is probably the most important aspect. Yeah, and that, that's very, very interesting. And I, I do wanna come back and revisit this specific topic, but this, the answer that you gave me has really triggered that I realized we, we started in, you know, in too far forward. Mm -hmm. What's thought leadership and, and how should an attorney think about um, themselves in a, in a thought leadership um, way. And before you start answering that, I want to, I, I want to add to this question, because I know, I, I know what, what thought leadership is for me. I want to hear your answer. Um, but one of the pushbacks that I get from attorneys is I don't have time, right? I don't have time to be writing blog posts. I don't have time to be active on social. I don't have time for these things. So does thought leadership require, and so as you answer this, I, I want you to also answer this question, does thought leadership require uh, a significant dedication of time to build this platform as a thought leader, or is there a way to use your team or a social media manager or, some, or, or a content copywriter or something like that to, to do that work? and you're still building a thought leadership platform yourself. Yeah, okay. So yeah, let's start with talking about what thought leadership is, first of all. So I think fundamentally, when we think about marketing, which thought leadership marketing is, is a form of marketing, obviously, uh, there's, there's essentially two ways to go at it. You can buy attention, right? Advertising, other forms of, of marketing that require you to make a financial investment, or you can earn it. So thought leadership marketing is a form of earned marketing where you are essentially taking your ideas, your expertise, you're packaging it in some form of content that could be writing, it could be podcasting, it could be public speaking or, or all of the above. And you're sharing that with your audience. Um, and the purpose of it is to is, is multiple, multiple reasons, but um, one is to position yourself as an expert, right? You, you want to um, be in a position where your brand, your yourself is associated with some set of ideas such that when a prospective client faces a, a challenge or an opportunity, they start to think of you as the expert who can help either overcome that challenge or capitalize on that opportunity. Um, and, and it really, the reason for it is because I think it's, it's more of the long game approach to marketing where you know, marketing, I think, um, it serves two purposes as it relates to business development. I mean, you need, in order to generate new business from a client, they need to become aware of you, right? That's a fundamental first step. And then over time, they need to start to trust you. Um, and that trust doesn't happen overnight in most instances. I mean, legal engagements sometimes come out of the blue, uh, you know, like a lightning bolt. Um, but more often than not, they are the result of making small deposits where you're building trust over time with a prospective client. They ultimately, and then when they do have that opportunity, um, you know, they think of you. And through your thought leadership marketing, through that sharing of ideas that you're doing, whether it be on LinkedIn or a blog, or again, a podcast, a, any form of, of, of thought leadership marketing can work, um, you know, they continue, it continues to cement in their mind that you're the right expert for the job. So it's all about listening to and understanding the pain points, the challenges, the questions of your audience, and then through your content, trying to answer those questions and address those pain points. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the purpose of thought leadership marketing. Again, it's, it's earning that attention in a way that um, establishes and deepens the relationship between you and your prospective client. Um, and, and as far as the issue of can, you, you know, this issue of time and, and, and effort, and I don't have the time to do it. I, well, as a, first, as a first step, I would say, you know, can you afford not to do this? What other, you know, what other investments are you making? And maybe some people can, I, I know there are attorneys out there who can, can, you know, invest the resources, the financial resources necessary to, to sustain their practice. And that's great. But um, oftentimes, you know, that, that takes that 
that takes a, an amount of money that many people can't can't afford. And um, and so there, then it comes down to your time. And and do you have the time to do it? Uh, it doesn't take all that much time, I don't think. Uh, especially if you're looking at something like creating content on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I find that many attorneys, if they devote their efforts to a platform like that, they're short posts that you you're character limited, so you can't spend a tremendous amount of time doing it, but maybe 30 minutes a day, you can have an active thought leadership effort in place in that amount of time. Um, but if, you know, even if that's not possible, I think you can outsource some aspects of this, but the problem being, you know, at, at the end of the day, this is really about establishing your voice and getting your ideas into the market and establishing that relationship with your prospective clients. Um, so I think you can definitely uh, outsource a lot of the logistical components of thought leadership marketing but there is going to be some investment required, I think, by the attorney to come up with the ideas, um, understand how they can add their unique take and experience uh, to that issue and, and be involved in at least in a collaborative sense where they're downloading their expertise to some other party who might be able to write that content on their behalf. But I don't think it's something you can totally outsource, like maybe some other forms of marketing. Yeah, I uh, totally understand everything that you just shared. Uh, one quick question. You had talked about this law of reciprocity and, and you need to really, uh, if you want people to comment on your stuff, like your stuff, you have to be going and, and, and checking out what they're doing and liking what they're doing and commenting on what they're doing. So is that built into that 30 minutes that you described, or is there some other amount of time that you need to spend per using your various connections and, and and are you just going by the feed or are you very specifically going to individuals that you want to um, have interactions with and and checking out specifically what they're posting yeah so uh yeah i think you can get that done i mean that doesn't take a whole lot of time i mean maybe say if you spend 20 minutes creating a post um spending five minutes connecting with a few additional people and then five minutes engaging with other people's content that could probably be done within that 30 minute window. Um, and I think part of it is identifying, um, you know, some of this is strategic where there are probably people within whatever niche you're operating within who have large platforms, who can bring more visibility to your content, who would be worth investing in, in terms of searching out their content and engaging with it. Because, um, you know, if you, if you can get people with large platforms to start taking notice of your content, again, through this rule of reciprocity, well, then that's going to bring much more visibility to your own. Um, so, so making the investment and in finding who are the who are the other thought leaders in your space who have the large platforms and who would be beneficial uh, to connect with and establish that relationship with that that requires a bit of you know strategic thinking and and research. Um, but once you do, you know, it doesn't, this doesn't require massive amounts of effort, just, you know, engage with someone else's post like once a week or maybe twice a week. And that's enough to get you on their radar screen where they're going to start taking notice of your own efforts. One of the things that I think holds people back from creating content is being stuck in this mode of what should I write? What should I write about? Right. Um, and I think if somebody has that 30 minutes and they spend the first 25 minutes trying to figure out what they should write about, um, they, they will end up with poor quality content coming out if they, if they put anything out at all. Uh, so my question to you is, 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 do you have a strategy around that? Do you create some sort of advanced content calendar? Like how, how planned are you in the content that you're putting out there into the marketplace? Uh, to avoid this, you know, uh, this conundrum of, of needing to come up with ideas every time you sit down to write a post? Yeah, great question. Um, so yeah, I'll talk about my process and it might help some people. And now this is going to sound, because I, I, you know, big part of our business, I mean, the whole way we market our business and it's really what we do. So we're trying to exemplify what we do through our own, our own content. So I'm, I'm producing quite a bit. Um, so that would involve maybe I'm doing seven to 10 LinkedIn posts per week, a blog post. I write uh, monthly columns for attorney at work and law.com. We put out a weekly podcast episode. Um, you know, I've, I'm writing books. A lot of stuff is going on, um, but it all builds upon one another. So what I, how I think about it and how I think other people should think about it is if you're thinking about, you know, creating a, a thought leadership marketing effort and using LinkedIn as a tool to do that, um, establish for yourself what I call content pillars. 
these would be, you know, three to five themes that relate to your area of expertise and things that you are interested in and are relevant to your target audience that you're organizing your content around. So, so in my instance, it's things like thought leadership, marketing, productivity, um, how to podcast effectively, things of that nature. So I'm not, I'm not just trying to, um, you know, think randomly about what should I write about this week? I have certain themes where I'm trying to stay in my lane. And then throughout everything I'm doing all week, the work I'm doing, the, uh, you know, things I'm listening to, things I'm reading, I'm running those, that content that I'm consuming through these filters that I've established for myself, the pillars. So ideas will start coming from everywhere. I'll have a conversation with a coaching client, you know, he or she will ask a question. Um, I'll, I'll realize that that's probably a question that many of my clients have. That'll be the topic for a, a post on LinkedIn. So I'm paying attention and, and I'm always keeping in my subconscious, like, all right, what could, what could be an idea for content that I'm bumping up against through my daily work and experience? Um, and then I capture those ideas. So in addition to identifying content pillars, I have what I call a, a knowledge ma management system where it's a simple, it sounds fancier than it is. It's just a notes app on my phone or on my desktop, which I'm, I'm dumping ideas into on a consistent basis. And that might be a link to an article. It might just be a phrase or a quote or a statistic, whatever it is, it's the, it's the uh, starting point for a post. Um, but I, I feel that it's very important to capture those ideas as they arise because ideas are fleeting. We've all had that experience where it's like, oh, I had an idea for something, but I lost it. You know, a few hours pass and you just can't, you can't capture exactly what it was um, that, you, that you had first uh, come across. So that, that's important. And then I think the key thing for actually creating this content is, is trying to do, um, like for LinkedIn posts in particular, what I do is I take like 90 minutes on a Saturday morning, I get up early and I try to batch write you know, as many posts as possible for the upcoming week. It's really hard to sit down to a blinking cursor every morning when, you know, the busyness of the workday is kind of creeping up on you and, and try to come up with something interesting to say. So instead of doing that, identifying, you know, maybe whatever it is, maybe you want to post twice a week, maybe it's four times a week. Um, in my case, it's seven times a week. And in 90 minutes, I can usually get those seven posts done um, because by batching, by doing it all at once, you give yourself the opportunity to work undistracted, maybe get into flow state, and you can crank through them because you're in that state of mind, as opposed to coming back to it every day, which be can become stressful and, um, and counterproductive. So I think that that sort of structure or methodology as it relates to um, you know, having an idea of what you wanna talk about or write about, um, having a mechanism to capture the ideas that arise, you know, as a lawyer, again, listen to the questions that your, your clients are asking you, what problems are they facing? Those are the issues you should be addressing through your content, but capture those ideas as you go. And then don't try to do it every day. Just try to do it all at once, like within a, within a block period of time, sometime throughout the week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is fascinating. Um, one of the things that, and I, I guess we're going to traverse back into, um, into strategy, uh, and then I want to go back. I have some more questions on thought leadership. So on LinkedIn, there's a business page, a personal profile. Um, uh, one of the, the things that, uh, can be unclear or, or get confusing is who am I, where, where is this content going? Um, and I'm guessing that you're doing everything on a personal profile. So what is the what is the purpose of the business page? And I know on Facebook, people are really careful, especially attorneys are, are very careful to try to separate their personal profile from their business. And they even join groups with their business page. Um, I don't think that LinkedIn operates the same way. Um, and it's not nearly as conducive to use your business page. So um, what, what's your insight on navigating exactly where this content is going and how to parlay those two, those two um, assets? Finding amazing employees is the toughest job for any business and especially for a law firm. You deserve to be the law firm owner you've always wanted to be, but you can't get there without a great team. Get Staffed Up helps you build your all-star team by staffing your law firm with incredible full-time offshore virtual assistants. Work with Get Staffed Up to save money and your biggest resource, time, while they find you the best English-speaking VAs in the world. 
Hashtag delegate your way to freedom. To learn more, go to profitwithlaw.com forward slash get staffed up. Profitwithlaw.com forward slash get staffed up. Thanks to our sponsor, Smith AI. Smith AI is a superior virtual receptionist service for small businesses. They specialize in working with solo and small law firms. I discovered Smith AI a couple of years ago and was blown away by the range of services, which are available at a cost any attorney, even those of you in the smallest solo practice can afford. Their friendly receptionists respond to potential clients in English or Spanish, screen and schedule new leads, and even take payment for consults. The best part is they don't just handle these conversations by phone. They also have live agents and chatbots capturing leads on websites and via text message. If there's one growth hack to your practice, this is it. Smith's friendly gatekeepers can staff your front lines. They'll capture new leads while you work uninterrupted. You can finally have the peace of mind that while you're working, you're not missing out on future work. Plans start at just $210 a month for calls and $140 a month for chats. They even offer a totally free chatbot, so there's no excuse. Try Smith AI today and see for yourself why attorneys like Justy Nickel in Colorado say, Smith AI receptionists are the secret to business growth and client happiness. Smith AI offers a free trial and podcast listeners can get an extra $100 discount with promo code ProfitLaw100. That's ProfitLaw100. Sign up and learn more at www.smith.ai. Trust me when I say, don't let another day go by. Try Smith AI. Yeah. So, right. I think it's beneficial to have a company page on LinkedIn, but it's not a great vehicle for creating and, and gaining visibility around content. I mean, like other social media platforms, you know, LinkedIn is always seeking to monetize and as a result of that, um, they suppress uh, company page content to a great degree. They want you to advertise in order to boost that content. Um, so as a result of that, people just don't uh, see that much content being shared by, by company pages because LinkedIn, um, you know, it's a, it's a social network. It's a professional um, networking site and people are connecting with other people, not necessarily other brands. So in, in almost all cases, I think it's, it's, you know, it, it's a good idea to be sharing content on your company page, probably helps from a recruiting standpoint to the extent you're trying to add talent. And it's just, you know, if you have the content, why not share it on your company page? But almost all of your individual content creation efforts should be focused on your own personal page. Um, again, people connect with other people, um, you know, they might follow a company page for whatever reason, but it, you're, you're going to see much greater distribution of your content um, if you're sharing it through your your personal page, um, your personal profile, as opposed to thinking about trying to do that via your company page. Okay, yeah, very good, um, great insight um, for for at uh, um, enhancing your connections, adding additional connections. Uh, I know that um, there, when you reach out to connect to somebody, uh, if you do it blind, you, you have an opportunity to to attach a message with your connection request. Mm -hmm. um, and I strongly encourage everybody to use that feature because otherwise they don't know why you're trying to connect, especially if it's not a colleague, you know, it's not attorney to attorney, but you're actually trying to build your potential client base uh, or people potential, you know, lead base. Uh, why the heck is this attorney trying to connect with me? Okay, we've got a couple of mutual connections kind of thing. So is there any strategy to that initial message when you're trying to connect with somebody to get them interested in wanting to connect with you? Yeah, I mean, I think you want to be able to demonstrate if to the extent possible that you have some, you know, shared understanding of what uh, might be beneficial to them. So meaning, are you, uh, are you an attorney who has um, expertise and is focused on a particular industry? If you can communicate some of that understanding of of uh, why it would be valuable to connect with you, such as, you know, I, I share, um, you know, that valuable insights on, on the, you know, these trending issues that affect your industry. Great. So, so why, because if you think about putting yourself in the other person's shoes, yeah, why do they want you uh, in their, in their feed? Um, are you going to be someone who's just going to be one of those that, that, immediately pitches the person that they um, connect with. And we've all had that experience, which is distasteful. Um, but I think even going back a, a step further where, 
okay, are there people who are um, people that you want to connect with on the platform who could be prospective clients for you? Um, the best way in my experience to, to make that connection request is to first, to the extent possible, engaging with them in some way on the platform. So if you identify someone who might be you know, a, a valuable client and you really wanna get them in your network, um, looking, doing a little bit of research and seeing, are they someone who creates content on, on LinkedIn? Um, and if so, can you go in and start um, reacting to and commenting on their posts? I don't care how big your platform is. I don't care how you know, high profile you are. People who create content on LinkedIn pay attention to those who interact with their content. And if you're someone who identifies someone they want to connect with and you're going in and leaving some substantive thoughtful comments on their posts, well, they're going to take notice of that. And oftentimes they're going to preempt your connection request with one of their own to you because we all want people boosting our content through their comments and reactions. So let's add them to our network because that'll just help our, our efforts on the platform as well. So again, to the extent that you can, to the extent that you can um, identify people that you want to connect with who are content creators, engage with their content, and, and the, oftentimes they'll connect with you. Or if not, you'll increase your, the likelihood to a great extent of them accepting your request if, if they've seen you popping up in their feed uh, you know, a, a couple times over the past week or two before that. Yeah, and what, what's interesting to point out to our listeners, if you're not that familiar with LinkedIn, is you might be used to something like Facebook, where you're pretty much only seeing and, and talking to people who are friends of yours, so you have to be a connection first. Um, on LinkedIn, all the content is public facing. There's nothing that, that's hidden from anyone else. Um, and your degree of connection with somebody is clearly there. When they see you, they could see you're a second connection, meaning that there, you have a mutual first degree connection or you're a third connection or, you, or you know, um, I, I don't think it's possible to be further than third degree connection. Somehow right. we're all connected <laughs> through somebody who's connected through somebody. Um, but essentially that, so uh, th what you just explained makes a lot more sense if you understand that you can see content that is not necessarily from a first degree connection, you can comment on it, you can interact with it. And that person can then see, oh, I'm not connected to this person yet. They're seeing my content, they're in interested in it. Um, and I can see how that naturally creates that, um, that fit. Now, uh, I, I found personally, when I was leading up to our summit, and I was looking for sponsors for the event, and I use LinkedIn as a tool to connect with companies that I did not have an end to. So I was already connected with a lot of companies through interactions through this podcast, through other vendors that had introduced me to, to, to them. Um, but there were companies who served the legal industry that I did not have a connection with. And I use LinkedIn as a strategy for that. Um, and I sent an initial connection request saying, hey, I'm you know Moshe Amsel, host of the Profit with Law podcast and the Law Firm Growth Summit. I believe that we have opportunities to collaborate. I'd love to have a conversation. I'd love to connect with you, actually, and say, I want to have a conversation with you. That was a follow-up message. Um, that worked really, really well. But when I do the same thing, reaching out to attorneys, and I say, hey, I'm the host of the Profitable Podcast, Law Firm Growth Summit, and I, you know, I would love to learn more about you, or I'd love to learn more about your firm, um, that doesn't work. That doesn't have a connection rate nearly as great. Um, so I think it, it, um, it, it's also unlocking the, what is the pain point or the need of the other person on the other side, that if you pitch this the right way, there, it's going to be a no brainer for them to say, oh, this is somebody I need in my life. I need to connect with them and, and learn more about them. Uh, when I was pitching to sponsors, they needed me, they need exposure for their brand. And they, they there's, here's a new outlet that we haven't seen before. Let's connect with this guy. Um, when it's to other attorneys, they're being pitched by marketers day in, day out. Um, that, you know, and, and they don't necessarily see how they need me, the podcast, the summit or any of that in their life with, with that initial connection request. So um, I can see how this strategy of engaging with them first could be way more successful because then they they can already see the the opinions that I have the 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 um, the way that I think and and be uh, engaged with that to say hey I need to connect with this person so I I think that some of it has to do with who you're connecting with and how compelling 
uh, and um, it is for them to connect with you on how much work you need to do up front to make that initial connection request. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, part of it is, yeah, it, it is hard. Like I, I have the same target market, right? I'm trying to connect with other attorneys. I mean, I found over time that that, that really takes care of itself, like through cre consistently creating content of my own, right? I, I have to think less about, I've got to at, go try to find uh, ways to add more people to my network because over time, if I'm continuing to share content that, that resonates with people, they're connecting with me uh, more often than not. So, you know, and, and if you, if you are, are you consistently writing on the platform, you know, once in a while, you'll, you'll start to learn more, you'll get more effective at it, you'll start to understand what kind of posts will really work really well with your audience, um, how to, you know, what kind of ideas are really um, sparking other interest. And, and once in a while, you'll get one of those posts that, you know, generates a significant number of views. I mean, I've had, I've had multiple posts who have generated more than 100,000 views, you know, 1500 reactions. You had, when, when that, something like that happens, you had hundreds of new connections of people connecting with you because that post is just getting such wide visibility that you couldn't, you couldn't possibly, again, getting back to this issue of buying versus earning attention, you couldn't possibly reach that level, that number of ideal fit client, uh, prospective clients in any other fashion. Um, but that, those benefits can only be realized by the consistency of effort that's required to, to kind of unlock those things. Um, so, so that's, you know, from a connection standpoint, you can, you can try to go find people or you can create things that are really appealing to the audience that you seek to cultivate. And they'll start connecting with you on a much greater basis if you do that. Yeah. I, you know what I've, I've found that in order to, there, there's a, there's a conundrum here, right? Because if you just rely on putting content out that will eventually gain traction, it takes time because it's a, it, it's something that it's kind of like uh, a wave that has to build uh, in order for you to get to that peak of the wave. Um, and the problem is, is that one of the first things you shared at the beginning of this episode is consistency is the name of the game. Like the reason that I am successful is because I am consistent. And I can tell you that's this podcast, right? Mm -hmm. the, the reason this podcast is successful is because we consistently put out an episode every Tuesday and every Thursday. Now it doesn't need to be twice a week, but that's the schedule we chose. Uh, we started with once a week and then we upgraded to twice a week, but we're showing up in people's podcast player every Tuesday and every Thursday consistently almost without fail. We recently had one that was delayed by a day, but that happens every once in a while. But when you need to be consistent, you need to have the motivation to be consistent. You need to, and, and what happens is, is I can tell you when I started this podcast, I did exactly that, right? I relied 100% on the ability of the medium to just create the search experience for somebody to find me. And I also did went out to other podcast hosts and invited them to be guests on my show, mm -hmm. which ultimately created some reciprocity where I got interviewed on other shows and that helped, you know, bring in the first set of listeners. But ultimately I relied on the search engine to grow the podcast and it was a very slow growth. As a matter of fact, there were plenty of times in the first nine months of its existence that I was thinking, you know, maybe, maybe this is the wrong medium. Maybe I should stop doing it. Um, I think we had a total of 5,000 downloads after the first three quarters of running the show. Um, but then I ran the law from growth summit, created another event, which then highlighted the podcast created new followers and, you know, and, and that, you know, then we had 5,000 downloads in a quarter um, and it was up from there. What I think when, when we're talking about LinkedIn and we're talking about, you know, just put content out there and then people will naturally gravitate to you to connect with you. I almost feel like you need to use both approaches at the same time, mm -hmm. or you need to find some people who already have a presence on LinkedIn to, get their attention so that they get so that they start interacting with your stuff because if you jay have built an audience of you know 10,000 attorneys and when you post something it gets 86 likes in a, in a day and 28 comments then if i post something and we and i'm doing this you know i'm i'm co constantly commenting on your stuff and you come you come back and you say oh moshe posted something let me see, let me see what he said and you comment on it now everyone who's connected with you is going to see my post cuz you commented on it um so i think that 
there's there's some extra steps in there that you might want to take in the early stages to help goose your your traction so that you don't feel compelled to to be inconsistent which is going to kill the whole strategy for sure right it, it that that's exactly right i agree with everything you said and it does it does take more of that effort up front and it does take identifying people who have those larger platforms trying to cultivate that relationship, being generous, generous with their content. And then again, most people will, will then reciprocate and be generous with yours as well. So you know, finding those people who are influential to the target market that you seek to serve and establishing those relationships, that's very key. Um, in addition to you know, being consistent with the content, finding that community, because LinkedIn, we, we oftentimes think about it, oh, it's 750 million users worldwide. It's this big, massive, you know, haystack, and we're just a needle within it. Um, but it's really, a, it's really a collection of these micro communities, right? There's legal mm -hmm. LinkedIn, there's healthcare LinkedIn, uh, people with shared interests, common job titles, they're connecting with one another. So there's all these micro communities on LinkedIn. How do you find your micro community and how do you immerse yourself within it? Um, sort of think about it as what is the ecosystem of attention that your ideal clients are paying attention to and participating in? And how can you get involved in that? And that's oftentimes finding those people who are influential to that audience and deepening the relationship with them, which will then help you establish yourself as a thought leader. Now, Jay, you've clearly um, put your stake in the ground in LinkedIn, right? That's where you're focusing your primary efforts, but you also guest post on, on, on blog sites. You also have books that you wrote. You have a podcast. Um, but clearly there's other places that your content needs to reside or needs to be besides for just on LinkedIn. What what is the 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 thought process, the strategy, the formula that somebody should use to try to navigate and figure out where do I start? What is mm -hmm. um, we can have somebody who's listening to this podcast that has a three thousand dollar, five thousand dollar a month marketing budget, and it's all going to a company that's doing SEO and mm -hmm. you know and making sure that their that their site is ranking on Google, and they have zero social strategy. Right. Mm -hmm. We could also be talking to a law firm owner who's just getting started and has not done nothing with their marketing. Um, where do you see something like this LinkedIn strategy fitting in the overall broader marketing picture? And is this a place to start or is this a place to to add on once you've harnessed a, a more major um, uh, content platform? Yeah. Um, great question. I, I do believe it's the place to start and, and I'll explain why. Um, marketing is all about ideas, right? I, every, you know, you, it doesn't matter if you're putting out what, what, whatever you want to call marketing, if the ideas that you're sharing don't resonate with your audience. And to me, the way I'm using LinkedIn and the way I recommend my clients do is LinkedIn is the starting point for marketing. It's the only place um, for that, that I believe you can go and, and get almost instantaneous market feedback to the resonance of your ideas, right? If I, I do posts that um, do really well, um, I have other posts that don't do quite as well. What I do is I gauge based on the audience reaction to my content because I've cultivated an audience of, of the clients, I, the types of clients I wanna serve. And if they're, if they're reacting well to an idea I've shared on LinkedIn, well, that's a good signal to me that I should then take that idea and perhaps build it out into longer form content. So if you were really following my strategy closely, you'd see that I have, you know, many, almost everything I'm doing off of LinkedIn originates on LinkedIn. So my our podcast episodes oftentimes will, um, will relate to a specific post I did on LinkedIn. I'll take a post I did on LinkedIn that might be 200 words and I'll turn it into a thousand word blog post. I'll build upon that idea. But LinkedIn gives me the opportunity to test those ideas in a way that you you can't you you can't do that by sitting down and investing five hours writing a, a long blog post. You have no idea whether that's going to land with your audience or not. So LinkedIn gives you that opportunity. Um, same goes for um, you know almost every every form of content that I'm creating. Um, and I think that lawyers should think about their content in the same fashion. But you know LinkedIn, can, I know lawyers who have built their entire practice just creating and sharing posts on LinkedIn. But I think that um, you, can, you can definitely think beyond that as well. Um, and again, we talked uh, for a moment about you know, these ecosystems of attention that uh, exist 
that your ideal client audience is paying attention to. Um, identifying what those are off of LinkedIn is very important. So what are the, what are the trade associations your, your clients are members of? What publications are they reading? What podcasts are they listening to? Um, when you can identify those things and then inject your voice through creating content for a trade journal or trying to appear in a podcast, that's great. So I think, but those ideas that you're generating that you might pitch for a trade journal article that you, that you guest post um, and, and create, those, those oftentimes will originate on LinkedIn. So I think it's a starting point, um, not, not just an add-on. It's, kind of it's kind of the wheel, if you will. And then all of these other opportunities are the spokes. Um, and one, one unexpected benefit of being more active on LinkedIn that I found and, and many of my clients find as well is that you know, there are many lawyers who think, well, isn't, you know, isn't social media a waste of time? You know, I, don't, I don't see what the point is, it's frivolous. Um, what oftentimes is, is uh, misunderstood is the fact that all of those opportunities, those marketing opportunities that someone might perceive as valuable that exists off of LinkedIn. So, you know, those guest publishing opportunities, speaking opportunities, appearing on podcasts, all of those opportunities, generally speaking, um, will become available to you by being a more visible thought leader on LinkedIn, because the gatekeepers to those opportunities are on LinkedIn looking for experts like you. So, um, you know, much of the way that we connected, where you saw my content on LinkedIn, invited me on the podcast, that happens all the time because those event organizers, podcast hosts, et cetera, they're on platforms like LinkedIn. And again, they're looking for people who have interesting ideas that they can bring in front of their own audiences. So, so that, that's why I think that LinkedIn is oftentimes that great tip of the spear for marketing, because it's just that ecosystem in which you can be very visible, test and share ideas, um, and, and get get it more organized around what content is resonating with your audience. Yeah. And, and I, I think that um, one of the things that you shared that I want to highlight is, uh, and maybe spin it in another direction is don't make assumptions about what people are willing to do or where, or where they're willing to congregate. When I first started working with law firm, when I, I actually got into the legal industry by mistake. So I wasn't a lawyer before, right? I was building an accounting practice and I happened to, through a, a, my relationship with Profit First, I'm a Profit First professional, with my relationship with Profit First, I happened to get a lead through their headquarters that was a, a law firm in Manhattan. That turned into a referral to another law firm, referral to another law firm. Before I knew it, I had five law firms as clients. And then from there, I, you know, I realized that there was a need. They all had a common problem going on. Uh, and I decided this is where I'm going to put my stake in the ground. I'm going to serve the legal community. When I first started in the legal community, I had these assumptions that lawyers are always pressed for time. So they're not going to be on social. They're not going to take the time to watch a video. They're not going to attend a three-day conference or five. My first one was five days, a five-day event. Um, and they're, you know, how many people are going to spend, take time to listen to a podcast. Now, if I had run with those assumptions, I, I wouldn't have anything today. Right. Uh, but the reality is, is that there are a ton of attorneys who somehow are finding time to be on, on social. Um, you know, there's Facebook groups that are super highly engaged with law, with lawyer, lawyers, law firm owners in it. Um, and they're consuming video. There, I mean, YouTube is huge for, for, for lawyers. We, we don't realize how huge it is. Um, you know, they're consuming videos. They're, they're on LinkedIn. So uh, they're, they're listening to this podcast, right? They're attending our, our summits. So uh, my point being is uh, just understand that whatever your target market is, they're no different than the other billions of people in the population. And if Facebook has more than 50% of the population on Facebook, Chances are your target market is there. You know, LinkedIn is is they're they're definitely behind Facebook as far as adoption. But if if your target market is has any sort of of commercial career um, business aspiration, they're going to be on LinkedIn too. Uh, so it's possible if you're doing bankruptcy law and you're only serving consumers uh, there, that it's possible that your target some of your target market won't be on LinkedIn. But guess what? There's a lot of middle class Americans who go through who go through bankruptcy, right? And you know that. Um, and many of them have jobs and they're they're on LinkedIn because they've got a job, right? So um I, I think that 
we, we need to be careful about making assumptions of where people are and we have to do the work to try to attract them and try to find them. Yeah, no doubt. And I think, you know, to that point about, you know, where is your target market? I mean, it, it don't overlook the fact that, you know, LinkedIn is the place where all lawyers are and obviously lawyers refer one another business. And, and also I found that the community of lawyers on LinkedIn is, is very generous um, in, and supportive of one another uh, by and large. It's a really, it's a different uh, vibe on LinkedIn than in Twitter and even Facebook to some extent. Um, in terms of just there's a there's a supportive aspect of it. Um, people are looking to connect with other people, support one another, and and that's I found that to be very true within the legal community. And and I know a lot of people are referring business back and forth there. So so you know part of your target market may be your 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 end client, but don't overlook the importance of connecting with the other lawyers on LinkedIn who can help you build your brand and and ultimately um, refer you business. Yeah, and, and you just mentioned Twitter and that triggered another thing, which is you don't have to be on every platform. There's a ton of attorneys on Twitter. I have zero, I mean, I'm on Twitter technically mm -hmm. and there and my team posts when we you know, release a podcast, stuff like that. But I've done zero effort to build anything on Twitter, target anybody on Twitter. And my business is doing just fine without it. Um, the point is, is that you have to make some decisions about where you're going to focus your efforts. You can't, uh, I shouldn't say you can't, you can but it would not it would not be a use a, a um, effective use of your time if you're trying to build multiple platform uh, communities at the same time uh, because it's that they all are time consuming and that adds up and then how are you going to serve your clients when are you going to you know you're doing this to bring in new business but then when you finally get the new business you're not going to have the time to continue what you're doing on the platform so you got to get to a point where you've got a system you've got things streamlined so that you're putting in as little time as possible and continue to build that, then you could think about adding the next, you know, the next piece of the puzzle. Yeah, I mean, you're you're going to be better off becoming. Uh, I, I think you know, it's one of those things where um, I think sometimes people think of of marketing you know, marketing as a term, as a skill, right? Where it's not, marketing is not a skill, um, just like sports is not a skill, right? I mean, uh, athletes tend to specialize in, in one sport. You know, you're, you're a good tennis player, uh, it, especially when you're talking about world-class athletes. It requires a lot of intense effort, not delusion, dilution over trying to become good at everything. And the same principle applies at, as, at, as it relates to marketing, where become good at something, uh, lean into and focus on the thing that you enjoy doing to the extent possible. Um, what do you have natural aptitude for? So that might be, you know, creating content in written form. It might be public speaking. Uh, you'll find a platform like either LinkedIn or Facebook, something that works for you. And, and you just, you know, you like the vibe, you, you connect with people well there, um, you enjoy the conversation focus in on things that you do well, develop that skill over time, and you'll benefit from that. But if you dilute yourself too much, like you said, you're going to have a really hard time gaining any traction anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we're nearing the end of, of our time together. Unfortunately, I'd love to just continue this conversation forever. But um, I do think that we we covered a lot of really, really good points. We, we gave a lot of food for thought for our listeners to Kind of digest and think about uh, thought leadership in general, which is, you know, that itself is a decision you need to make whether you want to be a thought leader, whether you want to build your business around yourself and uh, as as an individual who uh, is sharp and, and resonates with people. Um, but ultimately, I think that in today's today's day and age, and this, you know, this brings another Harrington to, to, to mind, Kevin Harrington, uh, one of the original sharks on Shark Tank, um, was a keynote speaker at our Law Firm Growth Summit. And in his talk, he talked about how his, as seen on TV business that he started, um, he, he now has, has gotten rid of, he sold, sold off the assets because it was a dying business, because TV viewership is, is in constant decline. And his whole talk was talking about recognizing that in the new digital age, you need to become a micro influencer because you need to, people need to resonate with you as a person in order to do business with you. And the more that we move away, one of my predictions for this year, at the beginning of the year, I do a prediction for the industry. And one of my predictions for this year was that we're going to see a significantly increasing, increasing decrease right? So, so a larger decrease 
um, of referral business coming into the law firm because for two reasons. Number one, um, COVID has created this situation where we have less and less social interaction and that's where referrals are made, right? So if I'm not getting together with my buddy at a barbecue and finding out that he's going through a divorce and, and then referring a divorce attorney to him, then where's that referral coming from? So people are more and more looking to digital assets to find their referrals and then they're going to check you out. So they're going to go and find where you are. They're going, to, they're going to Google you. And if you're active on LinkedIn, your LinkedIn profile is going to come up in that Google search. Now they're going to go and start looking at what you're posting and what you're... So you have to really think about thought leadership as, okay, this is something that I need to invest in long-term for my firm because this is where the world is going. Um, and so that's the first step is making that decision. And then it's choosing where you're going to put your, your, your stake in the ground. Where is my platform going to get built um, initially? And then grow from there. What is, you know, what is my primary platform and, and then how am I going to grow from there? Um, and I think that if LinkedIn is it, then this episode is going to be um, gold for you to just take this as your, you know, your toolkit, maybe even connect with Jay and see how he and his services can work to help you um, uh, enhance that. But if it's not LinkedIn, there's still a ton of uh, principles that we covered in this episode that can help you. Uh, get started and understand what you need to do. I mean, consistency, that doesn't matter which platform you're on. You need to be consistent. Writing short um, uh, pieces of content that are engaging, that speak to, the, to their needs, that, that's on any, on any platform. Uh, reaching out and creating connections by interacting with them in some other way, uh, that'll work on any platform. So you really need to start taking these nuggets out no matter where you're, where you're going um, and work with that to move forward. So uh, Jay, before I let you go, I want two things from you. Number one, uh, where can people find out more about you? Is there anything that you want to promote? Uh, remind us the name of your podcast, that kind of stuff. And then number two, I'd like you to leave one parting piece of advice. If you can just share one piece of advice with our audience, what would that be? Sure. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, so as to the first point, uh, definitely try to connect with me on LinkedIn. That would be great. I'd love to connect with you. And uh, that's a great place to see pretty much everything I'm doing. Uh, my agency website, again, is, is Harrington Communications. That's the name of the agency. Um, the URL is hcommunications.biz. My podcast, The Thought Leadership Project, um, we put out weekly episodes. Um, one thing I'll mention to the extent you are interested in learning more about LinkedIn and some of the things we talked about today, um, we are launching as of May 3rd, a new um, online membership site and training platform called the Thought Leader Collaborative. So that's thoughtleadercollaborative.com where you can get uh, all kinds of training resources on how to be an effective thought leader on LinkedIn. And then um, that, that would be uh, probably the places I would go and I'd appreciate connecting with you in, in various forms. Um, and then as far as a parting piece of advice, yeah, I would say that, it, you know, getting back to this issue of consistency, I wrote a book called The Productivity Pivot and um, Charlie Munger was kind of an inspiration for that book who many people will know as Warren Buffett's uh, business partner in Berkshire Hathaway. And he, uh, he was a, also, he is also a lawyer. And when he was a young lawyer practicing, he found himself getting bogged down by what many lawyers do, which is just grinding away at billable hours for clients. And he decided if he was ever going to get ahead, he needed to find time for himself to focus on things like professional and business development. So he, he had a mindset shift. Instead of um, spending all of his time working on the priorities of his clients, um, he started treating himself, as he put it, as his own most important client and selling himself one hour of his time every day. So he set aside the first hour of the morning to, again, um, do things like professional development, business development. In his case, he started working on these real estate deals that all ultimately got him connected with Warren Buffett. And the rest is history. But I think that lawyers um, oftentimes have a hard time prioritizing themselves in that way and, and really building a practice um, because they're always focused on their clients. And that's obviously important, but I'd argue that you know, we can all find 10% of our time, maybe again, that one hour every day, maybe it's half an hour, whatever it is, being consistent and finding the time to prioritize your long-term objectives um, such that you can make those small incremental steps forward, just like small deposits in a 401k account that will start compounding over time. 
I love it. I love that piece of advice. And it actually speaks right into, so we recently uh, did it. I recently did a solo episode talking about happiness and I did another one talking about uh, legacy mm -hmm. and the overall message of those two episodes was we always, a lot of us spend our time uh, doing what we're doing so that one day we can achieve this and then we'll be happy. One day we can do this and then we'll have our legacy uh, left behind us. And the overall message of that was you need to be happy today. You need to be building your legacy today. Everything you need to do has to be aligned with what you want to be remembered for and known and known for. And it's not something that's going to happen one day. And this is the same idea. If you are not, if you're not taking these little small actions every single day towards the bigger result, the bigger picture, um, then you're missing the boat. And I think that um, it, it can get difficult to, because all of a sudden you need a little bit of time for your exercise, a little bit of time for your own, uh, it, you know, um, emotional and, and, and spiritual results. And you need a little bit of time for building your thought leadership and you need a little bit, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but um, go read the book Atomic Habits and figure out how to really map your life out in a way that, um, uh, you know, that's going to, that's going to help you figure out how to get into the, the, the point where everything, all of these things become habitual, and then you don't have to think about them. You don't have to really try and be intentional about it because it just, it just happens. It becomes like brushing your teeth. Um, you can also check out a book called The Miracle Morning uh, by Hal Elrod. Uh, both of these books do a really good job of, of really helping you figure out how to, how to map your life out in a way that you're doing these things every day, rather than um, hoping that one day you'll have the time to do them, hoping that one day you'll be able to, to get to them. So I love, uh, I love that message specifically for marketing, but I think we can, we can use that in a lot of areas where we can, we can really use some help. Um, so awesome. We're going to link up all of those things in the show notes, your website, your LinkedIn profile, um, your podcast, Everything will be uh, uh, will be linked to in the show notes. Even if your book is on Amazon, we can link to that too. Uh, and Jay, I, I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate uh, your sharing uh, everything. Uh, you know, you didn't hold back, and and it, it's been super informative. And I hope that our our listeners um, appreciate it as well, uh, folks. Uh, we're here twice a week, every Tuesday and Thursday. If this is your first time listening to the podcast. Uh, there's a little subscribe button in your podcast player. Uh, when you hit that, you'll get notified every time that we release a new episode. And we'd love to have you as a regular listener. So hit that subscribe button and come back again. Uh, we're going to be here on Tuesday, uh, sharing some great stuff with you uh, with you once again. Actually, I say we, it's going to be me. Um, Tuesday is my solo day. Uh, so Tuesday is our solo day. Thursday is our, our interview day where we have guests on the show. Sometimes we mix it up a little bit, but that's essentially the format of it. Um, and the last ask I have of you is think of a colleague, a friend, somebody else who could really use this information, who would get excited about hearing this conversation we just had with Jay and share this episode with them. Uh, if each one of you shares it out, uh, that's going to significantly increase the exposure that I have, that Jay has, but more importantly, it's going to help double the amount of people than we've already done by, by you listening to this episode. So folks, thank you, Jay. Appreciate you being here and uh, we'll catch you on Tuesday. Take care. Thank you for tuning into the Profit With Law podcast. Your feedback is extremely valuable to us as well as helping us reach more people with this valuable content. Please leave us a rating and review in your favorite podcast directory. Join us again next time when we are back with even more strategies to profit with law.